Anyway, as far as field theory, we only have uh, we have uh, two field modalities, and we have one field. There is only one field. Now we think in terms of electrostatics, like the dielectricity. We think in terms of magnetic field, electrical, and then we think of gravitational field. But ultimately, I hope to make this really fast and simple for you to understand it. That there's only one field, and there's the loss of that field as expressed by magnetism, i.e. the loss of inertia, because there's only two principles that use rule the entire universe. Force in motion and inertia and acceleration. Well, how do you tie all four of them together rationally? Now, actually, let me show you this. Now, as you've seen underneath the ferrule cell, a magnet, doesn't matter what shape it is, looks exactly like this. It looks like a, a torus. It looks like a, a reciprocal, of course, most people can't visualize that. I can, a reciprocating processional hyperboloid, which sounds complicated, but is divinely simplex. Now, you see this spirograph-like hypertrochoidal pattern. We're able to get it overneath the camera better to show it to you in a slightly uncompressed fashion. There you go. You actually see a torus, a toroid, a spirograph, a hypertrochoid. That's the expression of the loss of inertia. Now, as Faraday called magnetism, he called it the dielectric field. But what does that mean specifically? It means that the necessitated loss of inertia, i.e. the ether, must be expressed as the creation of space, and of course the posterior attribute of the creation of space is a measure of movements of magnitude, which we call time, but of course time does not exist. Time is a human contrivance. Um, here we have dielectricity with absolutely no manifestation. There's a linear propagation. Now, we think of a single point, i.e. the ether, as being unmanifest. The longitudinal propagation, such as found in electromagnetism, i.e. radio or regular light, obviously has a longitudinal pulse between each waveform of the, electricity, of the electrical uh, value and the magnetic value of the waveform of the transverse electromagnetism. Now here we have electricity, which, by the way, is 5 times 5 Q and Planck electrification. Electricity is nothing other than the hybrid of electricity and magnetism operating together, which is found in, obviously, frequency and amplitude, constantly pulsing back and forth like this. So we have one field, one release of that field potential, i.e. the loss of that inertia, as expressed as in force and motion, and we have two field modalities, one being electricity, okay, frequency and amplitude, and the other one being gravity, which is a dielectric condensate. We have a nucleus, okay, right here we have tons of magnetodielectric space created, okay, space is not a thing, space is neither a field nor a force, space acts on nothing, space does nothing, this is the ultimate brain virus and huge flaw that Tesla says over and over again, as well as others of general relativity, is reified space as something that does something. It's like saying a shadow has done something, or a, you know, a shadow is the absence of something, okay? The absence of inertia, which is considered the central point here, which is not a point, it's even prior to a point, that the loss of that inertia is expressed in force and motion, leaves behind it a wake that us humans and our stupidity, all of us, call space, okay? We live in it, we breathe in it because we're all existential beings, but that space is neither a field nor a force. It does nothing, it acts on us. In the winter of 1896 and 97, the geodetic staff of the Correction Unity of Estero, Florida, conducted a survey on the Gulf Shore at Naples, Florida. This survey covered a period of several months, proving conclusively that the Earth curves upward and that we are living on the inner surface of a hollow globe. The sun, moon, and stars all being within the circumference of 25,000 miles. That the surface of the Earth is round, there, ha there can be no question. But that we are living on the outer surface of a convex globe rotating rapidly through space is pure assumption or guesswork. We have here a working model of the hollow globe or the cellular cosmogony as we call it. On the inner surface of this great 
shell, we find here the western continent. Over there is the eastern hemisphere. And here is the sphere of the heavens with sun, moon, and stars revolving. Contrary to the usual thought that the China is beneath our feet, it is in reality above us. I'm sure some of you, or maybe even most of you, know what Platonic solids are. That came from Plato and uh, Socrates' days, and Plato coined the term that these solids, there's five of them. There's the tetrahedron, the double tetrahedron, the, the, uh, the costahedron, you know, these are, these are Platonic solids. Well, <clears throat> Carr and his people came up with this double tetrahedron, which is is equally balanced any way you want to put this thing in any position it's a it's a square it's a circle it's elliptical it's a pyramid it, it's one object and it has a tremendous amount of power when you expose it to a magnetic field it's tremendous tremendous unlimited power and in the center of that field just like the utron that's where all the power is it's, there's an enormous amount of power in a magnetic field right in the center of the and we've been looking at it all our lives and we've never seen it. So you tell me, uh, how do you know there's an octahedron in the middle of the concave Earth, Steve? How do you know? Well, like I told you before, I read the Bible, Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7, laid it with measures, uh, stretched a line upon it, cornerstone was placed. Revelation 21 describes a city as wide it is, as it is long, as it is high, it's 12,000 furlongs. And then I found out that there's magnetic equilibrium points within the ocean along the equator at 90 degrees apart. And then we have a little corroboration from our good old buddies at Not A Straight Answer. You see, I was doing some studying up on the uh, meteoroids that hit the glass sky at 100 kilometers. And this lady was giving a presentation and she came and she, she mentioned this little gem. It just kind of piqued my interest. She said, the sources of these sporadic meteoroids are coming from the north apex and the south apex. They're also coming from the helion and the anti-helion. When you think of a pyramid and the word apex, an apex is the top of the pyramid, right? But if it's a north apex and a south apex, you're talking about a double pyramid, an octahedron, right? It's crazy, guys. Now, it's right, it's right there in plain sight. So let me show you. It's right there for you all to see. This is from a uh, sporadic meteor website. Sporadic meteors don't come from completely random directions, which your name implies. Most sporadic meteors come from six sporadic sources. Look at this. Look at this imagery. Look at this imagery, people. We have the celestial sphere in the middle of the Earth. We have the north apex side of the pyramid. We have the south apex side. I also mentioned to you before that the northern side was brighter than the southern side. Okay, now of course they're going to twist things, they're going to try to fit this in, within a heliocentric model. They're going to say, well, the apex meteor, the apex is in the direction of Earth's motion, so apex meteors collide head-on with Earth. The helion and anti-helion, these are the helion and anti-helion sources. Now this is also interesting too, because I mentioned before, on one side we have the Sun, and then we have the anti-solar point, the Gegenschein. It's right there in plain sight, people. So, and then they also talk about a toroidal origin, too. Let's see if I can get that one to you over here. There it is. Toroidal origin of meteors. Look at this, guys. So we have the helion and the anti-helion coming from the sun, and then we also have the Gegenschein where the sunlight converges on the opposite side, just like I told you before, the concave Earth. <gasps> then we have the north and south apex. We have the octahedron in the middle of the concave Earth, in the middle of heaven, behind the celestial sphere. And the north and south toroidal origin actually traces the perfect outline of the celestial sphere. Even this asteroidal one does as well. It's right 
there in plain sight. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the nail in the coffin for the concave earth. No doubt about it. Oops, wrong, <laughs> wrong image. No doubt about it, guys. No doubt about it whatsoever. This is what's going on, guys. It's right there. It's right there. Amazing. Amazing. Put the street light in these monopolar fields that I just described from these coils. We put this thing in the field within a matter of a minute or two of working the thing in the field. Full galaxy appears inside the bulb, just like a picture of one of these Nova a TV deals. You can spin the whole thing, the stars, the nebulas, the suns, all the colors of the rainbow is spinning inside a burned out street light and virtually powering and, and containing itself. Now we have a whole astronomical creation floating around in a light bulb on a workbench, and then it explodes the bulb. But after it explodes the bulb, for like a tenth of a second, it's not long, it sits there without any bulb to contain it. That's the creative force. This electrical monopolar field is to how creation comes about. There is no evolution or any of that type of stuff. It's the electrical field at the time creates what exists and it's always changing this way and that way. All living organisms are all based, just like all machines, are all based on the same mathematical function. All trees, plants, flowers, humans, everything's based on what's called the golden ratio.
point of creation center so everything's converging in at this center point which is the dielectric field it's destroying space formless energy before it's cast out and expressed through magnetism. This black spot right here is where the light has disappeared. It cannot penetrate this spot nor can it exist here because this is the point of center beetle convergence where light is literally sucking down like draining down a hole. Okay? At the center of every magnet there is zero magnetism. You see that underneath the ferro cell? You can see that underneath magnetic viewing film. You can even see it if you were to bring two magnets together with a gauss meter at the center. So, we know what's going to be at the center. The dark lines represent centripetal convergence. The white lines represent centrifugal divergence. So what you're seeing in the white lines is true magnetism. No, nope. they're moving in the exact same direction, only inverse to your spatial perspective. It's nothing. Space is the air inside this donut. The cream filling inside the donut of magnetic divergence it is literally the farts, the after, the after effect, the remnant remains, the fecal matter of the loss of inertia, which necessitates magnetic divergence and reciprocation. As Faraday called magnetism, he called it the dielectric field. And oddly enough, one of the first experts in electrical engineering was the guy who got closest, even closer than Tesla, to understanding what magnetism was in its relationship to dielectricity, because only... Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more.